Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mark Pousty, Dean of the School of Law at UCC, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Centre for Law and the Environment on enforcing EU environmental law. The webinar takes quite a broad approach to the notion of enforcement and covers a number of selected themes, including the role of the Commission, new environmental watchdogs in post-Brexit UK, the influence of EU law on public participation and developments in appropriate assessment. You will be able to tell that I'm not from Cork and I, I, I suppose being what might be described as a Brexit refugee myself, I'm very interested to hear about what substitutes there will be for the previous hard enforcement of EU and environmental law in the UK through the concepts of direct effect or by the Commission in front of the, the Court of Justice. This afternoon's event is generously funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs Communicating Europe Initiative 2020. This initiative is aimed at deepening public awareness of the role that the EU plays in our daily lives and at improving the quality and accessibility of public information on European issues, particularly at regional or national level. UCC's Centre for Law and the Environment has a really strong record in hosting events which provide cutting edge analysis of developments in law and policy. Its events are always aimed at a wide audience and are designed to facilitate discussion. It's also a key part of the school strategy to ensure that we engage effectively with the public through our events, and this webinar should certainly fulfill that aim. The funding awarded to the Centre by the DFA this year has enabled us to provide this webinar as an important forum for discussion around contemporary issues in EU environmental law enforcement. And these are obviously matters of public concern. We're delighted to host this important event again this year, albeit in virtual format. And we're really delighted to see such a high level of interest in the webinar among a wide range of participants. It's fantastic to see the high numbers who registered and who are attending. Just before I hand over, I'd like to extend my thanks to my colleague, Professor Onya Rial, and I'd like to congratulate her on her recent promotion to Professor. And I'd like to thank Onya for successfully applying again for DFA funding for this event and for organizing the webinar. And I'd also like to welcome our chair, the Honourable Justice Ms. Marie Baker of the Supreme Court and our excellent lineup of speakers. I'll sadly need to duck out before the end of the webinar this, this afternoon, but I will stay for as long as I can. I hope everyone will enjoy what should be an excellent afternoon. And now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Onya Rial. Thank you very much, Mark, for those very kind words. Many of you will be aware that this time last year, we had a very well received and very well attended conference at UCC in October 2019, where we were joined by the then Thonishten Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney. And of course, um, he's now very busy with Brexit and, and things are coming close to the wire. And we hope that things will work out um, in a way that uh, serves the interests of, of, of all concerned, but it's a very difficult time. And again, uh, with the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs, we have the Communicating Europe Initiative funding, and that has made it possible, as the Dean said, for us to run this event again this year. It's a shame, of course, that we're not all at UCC together in person, but the advantage of the online format is that we are able to reach a very wide audience. And I don't think we would have got close to 300 in Cork. Maybe we would, but we hope to have close to 300 of you with us um, virtually. So by way of some very brief opening remarks, since our conference last year, EU law has continued to develop at a very rapid pace. It's difficult to to keep track, as I say every year, with the evolving jurisprudence, not only from the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, but also, of course, from the national courts. And there are as well a, a very important developments in law and policy constantly coming into play. Because this is a short webinar, I've had to be very selective as regards the specific topics that we're able to cover this evening. 
And it seemed to me that the role of the EU Commission was fundamental. So um, we're delighted to have Sybil back with us this year. Uh, Brexit was another one that it seemed clear had to be included and thrilled, of course, to have Professor Colin Reid with us. And then um, we were spoiled for choice as regards what other topics we might look at, but having consulted with colleagues, we thought public participation, which is always a, of perennial interest, and appropriate assessment given developments in the jurisprudence seemed um, the most appropriate. But just to stress that because we had to pick those four broad topics, um, it's not in any way to downplay, of course, all the other issues that we could have chosen. We could have filled a couple of days uh, with, with quality content. But I endeavoured instead to go for short presentations and then to hopefully leave plenty of time for discussion. So turning then to more substantive points, be, before handing over to our chair, I just want to highlight the recent report on the state of Ireland's environment published by the Environmental Protection Agency just in the last week or so. That report, as many of you here will be aware, makes very grim reading. Um, it's clear that the outlook for Ireland's environment is not good. Um, the agency isn't optimistic in its prognosis. Environmental indicators are going in the wrong direction. Uh, predictably, it's climate and, of course, biodiversity that are identified as the two key challenges. And again, it's quite shocking what is and continues to happen to our rich biodiversity here in Ireland. And importantly, that EPA report draws that really strong interconnection between environmental quality on the one hand and human health on the other. And the agency, to be fair to it, has always been very good at highlighting that connection. And in the context of the pandemic, we would have seen people reconnecting with nature and coming to value again in a very powerful way the importance of environment and of environmental quality. But as the EPA report says, the Irish environment continues to deteriorate. And I think it's important to say that by way of background for our discussion and analysis this afternoon. It's interesting too that the EPA calls yet again for implementation and enforcement of the existing body of environmental law. And it also makes a recommendation for the development of a national policy position on the environment. And I hope that's something that's taken up and examined closely, the idea being to tackle environmental issues in an integrated way. Um, and again, if you think about it, environmental challenges are complex, they're interconnected. And where Ireland has fallen down quite significantly over the years is with a fragmented approach to policymaking and a very fragmented approach to how we make law and a fragmented legal framework, and I could go on. And I suppose just to finish by saying that we were also in the centre involved in a conference run by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Irish Centre for European Law on the 11th of November. And again, myself and my colleague, Professor Owen McIntyre, were delighted to be involved in that event. Uh, and just to stress that at that event, we don't have time to look at it in detail this evening, but we did with the assistance of Professor Richard McCrory from University College London, we did attempt to tease out a little that proposal in the programme for government for the establishment of a specialist environmental and planning court. And in the context of any conference to deal with enforcement, I thought it was appropriate to mention that. The model that the government appears to have in mind is one based on the current commercial court, which operates as part of the High Court, that particular model. But again, it remains to be seen how that government proposal will play out. So there's quite a lot happening. I think that EPA report is very interesting. Will we or will we not see an environmental court remains to be seen. And rather than go on, as I could do, I think at this stage, I would prefer to hand over to our wonderful chair, Ms. Justice Marie Baker of the Supreme Court, who also um, chaired this event last year at UCC and did an absolutely excellent job. So there is no escape and we had to have her back and we were thrilled when she was available and volunteered to do it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ms. Justice Baker and thank you. Thank you, Anya. It's been, a, I think, a very big year. Um, quite apart from the fact that it's been an extraordinary year and nobody this time last year could have predicted the pandemic. And I do recall the, um, the, the, the introductory remarks of Simon Coveney last year and the sense that the big issue we were facing was going to be Brexit. And now, in fact, we faced something quite different as well. Um, but it's been a very big year in the courts. Um, there have been a number of Supreme Court decisions in particular that have been landmark in a sense, but maybe not necessarily um, that they, the judgments that should be seen as landmark, but judgments that should be seen as marking, waymarks rather than landmarks. 
Um, the, the climate change case got a lot of publicity. It was on one reading of it, just an ordinary judicial review, just an ordinary view of uh, the government's climate change plan, which had failed to meet the requirements of the legislation. It's, it will be interesting to see how some of the commentary in the judgment, some of the obiter comments, some of the development of themes in the judgment will act, will evolve and whether the placing of the environment in that case will be run with, I think is the expression in subsequent cases. Uh, it was certainly one of the highlights of the legal year in terms of how dramatic it was, I suppose. Um, but there are a number of other cases which, of course, are hugely important. The Sweetman on Tashka case, the, the striking down in effect of the substitute consent regime. Probably people felt it was about time um, that that was a, a particular way of dealing with the replacement for retention permission, which wasn't entirely satisfactory. It's a, it, it is clearly a very important judgment for enforcement, which is the kind of sub theme of, of, of today's conference. And it'll be interesting to see what legis legislation will um, replace what's there now and how it will evolve in particular in the JR side of the High Court. Um, there are two other cases I just want to mention. Um, one, uh, they're, they're twin cases in a sense, they both raised fairly similar issues, very difficult issues regarding the granting of stays. Um, Kirke and Baltz, um, one um, Kirke related to a section 160 injunction, uh, which hadn't yet been determined at appeal stage. But the question that arose for consideration in that case was particularly important as a very complex judgment. And it was whether the general principles that operate um, for the grant of a stay, the preservation of the status quo, et cetera, the interests of justice, whether that's the correct approach in section 160. And the judgment of O'Donnell J said it was not. Um, the, the twist in that, of course, and the twist in both of those cases was the substitute consent and the fact that the rectification of the planning status of the, of the developments wasn't therefore it wasn't possible on the old route. Bals was the other side of the enforcement and what was to happen with um, a, a certiorari after a final decision was given on a judicial review, whether there could be a stay and what were the factors that might influence thinking of the court there where it was balancing fairness and whether the same principles applied to the grant of a stay in those circumstances. These are very important judgments. They will play out, I think, um, over time. But I, I would say it, was a, it, it has been an important year in the scheme of um, planning in the courts. There have been a number of big decisions in the High Court as well, and fewer in the Court of Appeal. Um, O'Connor and the County Council of, of Offaly was possibly eventually a bit of a damp squib um, in the sense that it, it, it didn't possibly, maybe, maybe people think it raised a big issue, possibly didn't. Um, but there are a number of other judgments uh, which in, in the High Court which will be dealt with by the other speakers, so I won't refer to them. Um, one thing I think is fairly satisfying um, is that cases are getting on very fast now in the Supreme Court. They're being case managed with quite a lot of care um, so that the issues are being reduced. And um, that has to be something that will certainly please civil and will please the commission because the, the delay in getting cases on in Ireland has certainly been something that has caused a lot of practical difficulties, but also has, has in some cases led to the continuation of environmental damage. The, the, the average time now is about three months from the lodging of a notice of appeal or from the grant, I suppose, from the grant of leave to when you get on. And in that time, the case would be fairly well case managed so that the issues become identified and isolated. Um, I, I have no particular view one way or the other, and I wouldn't tell you if I did, I suppose. Um, as to whether we should have a specialist environmental court 
but I would say we probably do have a specialist environmental court. Um, we have Mr. Justice Simons, Barneville, now, now Humphreys, dealing with the strategic infrastructure and planning cases in the JR side or the strategic infrastructure side. Um, and they are knowledgeable, efficient, and um, the delays that might have led the government to think that a specialist court was necessary might not be, in fact, a, a significant factor anymore.